Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel where we talk about skincare, grooming, and sometimes hair, so that sounds like a thing. Make sure you are subscribed. Also, come and follow me on Instagram where I post a lot of stuff you're not gonna see here on YouTube. And TikTok, and Facebook. I'm active on Twitter as well, just, just, um, follow me. <laughs> Today I want to talk about some more skincare mistakes. And not just like, you know, oh, you're using this product wrong or any of that kind of stuff. I want to talk about mistakes we are making, including myself as consumers, when it comes to picking a product to buy, picking a product to spend money on, picking a product to test out. Also, please bear in mind that these are mistakes that up until a week ago I was doing myself, you know, and probably will still make in the future. But I just want to share a few things that I've discovered of recent. Let's talk about the first one. This is something we all do. I can pretty much guarantee, including myself, and that is judging a product by its ingredient list. Like how else are we meant to judge a product, right? I did speak about this very, very loosely in one of my Fenty skincare videos, not the review, but the video about what Fenty skin taught us. We look at an ingredient list and we see an ingredient on there that has been demonized. For example, denatured alcohol, fragrance, silicones, you know, the, the usual culprits. And we do this all the time. But what I've learned is that reading an ingredient list isn't as simple as reading an ingredient list and picking out each individual ingredient and thinking, right, that's in there, this product's bad for me. Or that ingredient's in there, this product is good for me. What we don't know as average consumers or influencers that a cosmetic chemist or formulator or someone who works with skincare on clients day in, day out, what we don't know like they know is how ingredients interact with each other, how ingredients can change function, what ingredients actually do within a product beyond a quick Google search, how certain ingredients cancel out the pros and cons of a particular ingredient, there's just so many different factors to an ingredient list. One example I get all the time and that I'm fully aware of is denatured alcohol. It has this reputation for being drying, um, killing skin cells. <laughs> However, a lot of people will pick up a product, read the ingredient list, see denatured alcohol and put it straight back and cuss it out for drying out your skin when that product is a moisturizer, for example. Obviously, if DNH alcohol is a hydrating or moisturizing product, it's not gonna dry you out because that's the exact opposite of what the product is going to do for your skin. There's many things that denatured alcohol can do. It's a preservative, it's a penetration enhancer, it stops oily products being too oily, or it stops the oil in products being too oily. And most denatured alcohol actually evaporates off the skin. I highly recommend you check out this Instagram TV by Andy Millwood. He's a facialist, an aesthetician, and a respected educator within the skincare community. He posted this IGTV about our obsession with reading the ingredient list and breaking that down. He reminds us that formulation is queen when it comes to analyzing our products. The formulation is so much more important than just individual ingredients. He goes on to use the cake analogy, and I've heard this before. I think I actually heard it from Lab Muffin Beauty Science. And that analogy is this. So you give me, someone who can't cook, I struggle to cook an oven pizza. You give me a recipe for a cake. You give a professional chef the exact same ingredients. And we go off to our separate kitchens, right? We got the same ingredients, but we're gonna come out with two very, very different cakes. There's so many factors that go into formulation of this cake or formulation of a product. For example, I have a very basic oven. I'm probably gonna burn things. I'm probably gonna make a thick, soggy mixture, thick and soggy, a dense cake. I might overbeat eggs. I might not need the cake. Do you need cake? No, that's bread. I might not mix stuff properly. I'm probably gonna be using my hands to mix stuff. Whereas the professional chef is gonna be using like the highest of industry standards uh, oven. He's gonna be using like professional mixers. He's got these years of experience behind him. And even when it comes to the exact ingredients, I might have a really crappy, you know, like 80 eggs for a pound. He might have like six eggs for five pounds, you know? It depends how those chickens were brought up. You know, there's so many factors to those ingredients. So one nice and might may not be the exact same quality as another, you know? There's so many factors. So to kind of just look at a product and judge it on that ingredient list is kind of a little bit naive now. I feel a little bit stupid for doing that. I feel like an ingredient list is great for checking if there's any allergies in there. So if you really, really are sensitive to fragrance, if you really, really cannot stand witch hazel, for example, it's good to know, obviously it's important to know what is in your product, but to look at something and be like, oh, I shouldn't use it because I've heard this is bad, isn't really the way to go about judging your products. You could be missing out on products that are amazing for your skin. In a similar realm, was that a pigeon? Filler ingredients. <laughs> I do this all the time. I don't think I really know what this means. Let's talk about filler ingredients in products. Another ingredient-based mistake that a lot of people make, and I 
personally have been aware of this again um, for a couple of years because I follow some amazing, amazing people on Instagram. All these people's handles you can find in the description box down below. I've seen people review products and um, leave comments in my videos about particular products saying, well, that product's not worth the money, it's just full of filler ingredients meaning there's apparently useless ingredients within the product, usually to um, add a texture to the product or bulk out the product. I feel like a lot of people think water is added to products to bulk it out and make it look like there's a lot more for your money. But a lot of people look at that and think, well, I'm paying 20 pounds for water. Mm, no, you're not. Well, you are because it's in there, but you know, other stuff as well. Filler ingredients don't exist. So Annalisa, aka Skin Perspective, over on Instagram, one of my favourite, favourite um, people to talk to. And her profile is just so, it's just a wealth of knowledge. She's a cosmetic formulator and she busts a few of these myths. For example, when water is the first ingredient, the product is mainly made of water and not worth your money, is one of the myths, right? So Annalisa explains that a lot of our favourite ingredients, like niacinamide, for example, and hyaluronic acid, come in a powder form. So water is a solvent that's actually going to carry these ingredients into our skin and actually allow these products to work. So water is a solvent that's actually going to carry these ingredients into our skin and allow these ingredients to do their job. Another myth she mentions is that companies fill their products with filler ingredients to bulk out the products and to save money. As I said, this just isn't true. <laughs> like, if anything, they're going to use less ingredients. They're not going to keep adding like, oh, let's add this in and let's add this in to make it look like there's more. They're not going to do that. As a cosmetic formulator, Annalisa assures us that there is no such thing as filler ingredients. Everything is in that product for a reason. Even if they don't look like anything fancy, water, important. <laughs> Here's one that's really like my own personal kind of thing, and that is judging a product because it has nice packaging. Not because it has bad packaging, but because it looks good. This is a really odd trend that I see um, amongst a particular sort of skincare lover. You know, they're usually on the like skincare threads, bitching about YouTubers <laughs> and other products. The armchair scientists of the skincare world. Ages ago, this stems from when I insulted CeraVe, CeraVe's, pa CeraVe, CeraVe's packaging because I said it looks like it's a prescription product. The, the packaging makes it look like it's um, fungus cream or like for piles or verrucas, you know? In the video I mentioned that this is actually on brand for what the product is. It's very, very simple products. It's got this pharmaceutical feel despite I don't know, I know the ingredients are different here in the UK. It's got a pharmaceutical feel despite it not really having any kind of like medicine, medicinal product ingredients in there. But it's got this very simple packaging, very simple product, get the jobs done. It's perfectly on brand. I just don't like it. Also, I've never had an amazing luck with the products. I like maybe one face wash of theirs, an eye cream that I don't use anymore. Other than that, I'm not a fan of the products. Oh, actually I'm using the healing ointment and that's very, very good. <laughs> It's a great brand that I recommend for anyone's skin who has kind of been through the wars. But one thing I noticed from the comments is a lot of people immediately associate fancy packaging with terrible products and simple packaging, in my opinion, sometimes bad packaging, with good products. And this just isn't true. All fancy packaging shows is that the company has a lot of money and can produce nice packaging alongside a good product. They have the money to hire great graphic designers, great artists. That does, however, mean that we will be paying more for the packaging. They're gonna add the cost onto that. What they're not going to do is make a really shitty cheap product and then spend a ton of money on the packaging, then lure us in with that. Brands, despite what people think, brands want us to keep buying their products. They don't want us to look at a product, use it, break out in a rash because it's terrible, and then never use that product again. They want to keep making a profit. They want us to keep returning and using that product so we can give them money. That's how business works. Along with this money for amazing packaging, amazing designers, they probably got the budget for amazing cosmetic formulators and chemists as well. Packaging is just part of marketing and advertising, which always, with every brand, brands like, for example, The Ordinary, who don't need that kind of big budget, but there are other brands who like to spend a lot of money and see, and see success spending money on advertising and marketing, just like online influencer marketing, which in fact, CeraVe do do. The Ordinary gift a lot of products to influencers as well. Oh, well. <laughs> But yes, brands want you to buy their products. They want you to repurchase their products. The packaging is part of that. The packaging is what draws us in. And there is nothing wrong with that. If you pick up a product because you like the packaging, you read the description, you check out the ingredients, which we're not supposed to do, but kind of are, <laughs> and the product looks good to you, don't feel bad because you picked up a product with nice packaging. If you don't mind that a little extra cost to pay for nice packaging, 
then just buy it. Enjoy it. Good skincare doesn't have to be in clinical packaging. I don't understand, like, you know? There's too many skincare snobs at the moment. Too, too many of them. <laughs> and I don't have an expert opinion on this, but I do know a lot of brand owners who I've talked to. We've had this conversation about packaging before. Um, I've helped brand owners pick packaging. One thing that a lot of influencers do, um, other than what you see on camera, is actually we go to, I don't know how many people do this, but we go to the offices of some of the biggest brands and they talk about up and coming products. Um, can I talk about this? I've done a lot for like shaving companies um, and skincare companies under the same kind of umbrella where they show me the packaging, the design, like everything visual about the products. And we basically sit there and rip it apart or say what we love and hate about it. So I know what a big part packaging has to play and why there is so much money when it comes to how the product looks in general. It's to get you to use their product that they made, which is usually amazing. Let's talk about buying skincare from third-party sellers and buying off Amazon, Wish, eBay, websites like that, AliExpress. I talk a lot about brands that I can't get my hands on because they're based in the US or Korea and they don't deliver to Europe or the UK. Europe's huge, I don't know why I say that, to the UK. I understand that there's logistical restrictions at play. I appreciate that. But along with that, I get a fair few comments suggesting websites that I can buy these products from, third-party sellers. And these are usually fake products or independent sellers that are bulk buying these products and then selling them for themselves with a huge markup price. Websites like eBay and Amazon have been called out for not having heavier, um, like a heavier, what's the word? A, a stricter process when it comes to analyzing um, independent shops that are selling fake skincare. Counterfeit products, especially brands like The Ordinary, there's a lot of fake ordinary products on Amazon. If you go into the YouTube search bar and type in uh, counterfeit ordinary products, you'll see people comparing them and a lot of them bought these from eBay or Amazon. Allegedly, for legal reasons. Wish, for example, have an unbelievable amount of fake Korean skincare, all kind of like these fake verified shops. And I know a lot of brand owners of these, um, or at least the PR people from these um, shops. And I've confirmed with them that they are not official sellers, yet they have these blue ticks. It's very misleading. If you scroll down to the reviews on Amazon, for example, they have a verified purchase. This doesn't mean a lot. What a lot of brands will do is send products to their friends, for example, and get them to review the product for them. Or they can just like say someone's purchased it and they can do a verified purchase comment. A lot of people will name their names as official shop names. For example, The Ordinary Official or just The Ordinary. And it will look like an official store on Amazon. But really, there's nothing legitimate behind this. To ensure that you're buying legitimate products, make sure that you are going going onto the official website and looking at official retailers. Some of them you can type in your postcode or zip code and it'll show you where shops sell. It will tell you online stores that they actually sell on. And you can always contact the brand themselves um, over like Twitter customer service, for example, send them the link and be like, is this a legitimate product? And they'll let you know whether this is a verified seller. This is another thing as well. As far as third party sellers go, you don't, they're not verified. So you don't know how they're treating those products, how they're storing those products. If they're mixing in real products with counterfeit products, you just don't know. There is actually a website called uh, Fake Spot, I believe it's called. And this lets you know if a product is likely to be fake on Amazon. I've also started using a shipping service called Ship It To this isn't sponsored or anything, <laughs> that creates a temporary US address for you in their warehouse. You order your products to them and then they ship it to you here in the UK or in other places across the world. So I use that, it's a little bit pricier, more than what I would like to spend, but usually I split the um, uh, delivery costs with my brother. One of my favorite brands, Crave Beauty, um, my friend Leah Yu is the CEO. She's a creator of Crave Beauty. And this is a brand that don't sell here in the UK. And a lot of people always point me to stores online that are selling Crave Beauty. They aren't official retailers. What these people have done is bought these products in bulk, shipped them over, and now they're charging more and putting usually huge markups on these products. I actually got in touch with Leah and asked if I can just get a bit of information on why she would personally advise against buying brands like hers, any other brand from unofficial sellers, unofficial retailers, third party retailers, and whether, you know, the products are fake or not, why she would advise against buying from somewhere that isn't an official retailer. Leah mentions that this is really due for quality control reasons. Um, at times the way they store their products are not in an optimal condition, either too hot or too humid, so the formula might be compromised. Meaning if the products aren't being stored properly, if they're not, you know, being kept in good conditions, optimal conditions, you're gonna receive a faulty product and the brand can do nothing about it because you bought it from a third party retailer. There's some people who have said to me that they um, didn't enjoy the Matcha Hemp Hydrating Cleanser because of the lumpy texture. And they sent me pictures. And I'm like, where did you buy this from? And they got it from a third party website. And I have bought 
uh, five, five in my lifetime of these products of the Crave Matcha Hemp Hydrating Pro- uh, Cleanser. The consistency has always been consistent and I bought it from an official retailer being Crave Beauty. And this to me is a perfect example of, right, you bought that from a third party retailer. It's probably been like a damp attic or like, you know, God knows where. So now you have this awful, awful opinion of this product that's actually an amazing product. However, there's always going to be an alternative to a product that you can't get your hands on. And I like to think that's what like skincare influencers are good for. No, like we're not good for anything else. The reason I review so many products is because I want there to be a review online of a particular product. For example, a lot of people I know in India can't get the ordinary, so they opt for revolution skincare which is a good alternative. I would highly advise against people in India going on Amazon and buying The Ordinary because it's probably going to be counterfeit. So Revolution, whilst not my favourite brand because they copy a lot of stuff, is a great alternative. So there we go. There's a few things I think we all need to be on the lookout for now when purchasing our skincare. With skincare getting more and more popular, there's going to be things popping up everywhere. And we just need to keep our eye out a little bit more and kind of like be less scared of our skincare as well. I always say this, but remember cosmetic formulators aren't working for the devil. (laughs) They're not trying to poison us. They're not trying to kill us. They're not trying to make our skin fall off. So as I mentioned, I'm going to put the Instagram handles of some amazing people I follow in the description box down below. These are everyone from dermatologists, estheticians, cosmetic formulators, science educators, a whole range of views and opinions that I think it's important to get a mix of so we can make up our own mind from professional opinions and decisions. Does that make sense? Yeah. But that is it from me now, guys. I will see you next time. Bye.